Welcome to Dark Crossroads Podcast, hosted by Roxanne Fletcher. This is your stop for all things true crime and paranormal. From the infamous story of the New Bedford Highway Killer to the chilling tale of the Black Eyed Children, Dark Crossroads Podcast is a truly deep dive into the stories that frighten and fascinate you. All links to the show will be provided in this episode's description. And don't forget to let us know what you think of today's episode wherever you listen to podcasts. Dark Crossroads Podcast is brought to you by Problem Wildlife. Problem Wildlife serves all of Western Massachusetts and has been humanely protecting your house and your family from unwanted pests for over 20 years. Take back your space with an animal control service that you can trust. They are family-owned, fully licensed, and are knowledgeable and dependable. To find out more about their services, simply visit their website at www.problemwildliferemoval.com. Again, that is www.problemwildliferemoval.com, and their information will be included in our show notes. Hey guys, so this episode we're covering a cryptid, so if you're feeling into that, um, stay tuned. If not, you can skip ahead to the next true crime story. And I would love to hear from all of you about what you think of the story, and if you have any encounters or stories related to this one, send them in. I would love to hear them, and you could also get a chance on being in another episode. But with that said, let's just jump right in. In the southeastern part of Massachusetts is Bristol County, an area known locally as the most haunted place in all of New England. The energy that sleeps there has been rumored to cause haunted schools, ghostly armies, and unexplained suicides and murders. Forested areas of the county have long been known to contain a litany of unexplained animals, ranging from Bigfoot and Thunderbirds to large snakes and odd bear-like monsters. For the past 40 years, cults have flocked to this area, and their activities, which often has been criminal, keeps local law enforcement busy. Of all the unknown horrors that live in Bristol County, the most feared is not an animal or a ghost or the members of these satanic cults. It is a demon, only two feet high. And if the history of the area represents the history of our America society, these Puckwudgies are the gatekeepers of our darker side. The Puckwudgies have haunted the forests of Massachusetts since before the first European settlers ever thought about setting out for any new land. For centuries, they tormented the local Native Americans and crept their way into their creation myths and oral history. They are often easily passed off as legend, and in fact, their physical description is much like a mythological creature from other cultures during other times. The difference is that these demons jumped from the page and evolved as the people around them changed, changing from reluctant helpers to evil tormentors. The difference is these demons are still seen by people today. Most cultures' mythology has some reference to small monsters that have strained relationships with humans. In many ways, this makes sense. While larger monsters like Bigfoot have their place in people's fears, the smaller creatures find their ways into the shadows of our rooms or under our beds. Their names and nature change, but there are always common threads that link them together. Some are called monsters, and roam the land looking for human food and kidnapping anyone that they can find. Others are called demons, foul spirits that feed off the negative and expose the sins of mankind. When referring to one, its classification gets blurred and these two words become interchangeable, perhaps showing us how closely associated these monsters are with pure evil. Veterans returning home after World War II talked of gremlins tearing apart their planes or getting into jeep engines and causing complete havoc. Also, Hindus speak of a similar creature, which is known as the Night Wanderer, who eats human skin and jumps into the dead to possess him. Africans tell stories about the Iloko who lure people with beautiful music only to devour them after they have been bewitched with an ever-expanding jaw. Although passed off as works of fiction and imagination, 
trolls, and dwarfs have existed in people's fears for centuries. They have become lovable and noble now, but the original stories recorded of these monsters are anything but fairy tales with happy endings. Trolls were notorious for ambushing travelers and destroying whole families on a whim. While some are described as giants with humps and one eye, many older cultures, especially in Scandinavia, described the being as the size of a plump child. Dwarfs have always been small, and their manners much better, but the end result seems to be the same. Like a troll, they are known as metal and stone workers, but unlike their flesh-eating counterparts, dwarves seem to avoid human contact. While they would prefer to be left alone if impeded upon their work, they become like caged dogs. One variation of the dwarf is a tommyknocker, who lives in mine shafts and is sometimes said to be the ghost of miners who have perished in the line of duty and are doomed to work for eternity. They are known to cause cave-ins and fires in the shafts. Perhaps the most famous of the small nightmare are seen by the Irish. Fairies patrol the roads in Ireland, causing problems for any traveler who strays from the path. They live in hills or mounds and dance around fires. If a human comes across their mound or sees them dancing, they are caught and they are held captive. Even the beloved leprechaun was once a malicious spirit before he was Americanized and transformed into the gold keeper that he is today. Exposure to nature seems to feed these tales, and the more a society depends on the earth for its needs, and the closer the relationship people have with the natural world around them, the more these stories seem to pop up. In this country, the people who first settled here had a close, if not friendly, view of small dangers around them. The Cherokee, for instance, have a mere image demon, which looks and talks like Cherokee, but are only a few feet high and have long hair that touches the ground. Although most people cannot see them, they are known to throw objects, trip up hunters, and abduct people who wander off. In Canada, there is also a similar creature, and it looks much like the classic alien, which is gray. The Wampanoag Nation, the dominant Native American tribe in Massachusetts and southern New England, had a monster who still dominates the landscape they once roamed. The Pukwudgie made its first appearance in the oral folklore of the people of Cape Cod, but recent sightings have forced people to rethink this mythological creature. Standing between two and three feet tall, the Pukwudgie looks much like our modern idea of a troll. His features mirror those of the Native American in the area, but the nose, fingers, and ears are extremely enlarged, and the skin is described as being gray or washed out, smooth, and at times has been known to glow. What makes these monsters dangerous is the multitude of magical abilities they use to torment and manipulate people. They can appear and disappear at will, and are said to be able to transform into other animals. They have possession of magical poison arrows that can kill and can create fire at will. They seem to often be related to a tall, dark figure, often referred to in modern times as shadow people. In turn, the Pukwudgies control the Taipaiwankas, which are believed to be the souls of Native Americans that they have killed. They use these lights to entice new victims in the woods so that they may kidnap or kill them. In European folklore, these balls of energy or light are known as will-o'-the-wisps and are said to accompany many paranormal occurrences. Side note here, this is, I don't know if you guys have watched Brave or watched Disney, but there is a scene with wisps that guides Mirida through the forest and it's little balls of light and it actually is portraying exactly what is said here, which I find extremely interesting. Modern paranormal investigators call these orbs and catching one on film is the gold standard of field research. Legends of the Pukwudgie began in connection to Masha, a creation giant believed by the Wampanoag to have created most of Cape Cod. He was beloved by the people, and the Pukwudgies were jealous of the affection that the natives had for him. They tried to help the Wampanoag, but their efforts always backfired until they eventually decided to torment them instead. They became extremely mischievous, and they aggravated the natives until they asked Quant, Mashop's wife, for help. Mashop collected as many as he could. He shook them until they were confused and tossed them around all of New England. Some Pukwudgies died, but others landed 
regained their minds, and made their way back to Massachusetts. Satisfied he had done his job and pleased his wife, Mashop went away for a while. But in his absence, the Pukwudgies had returned. They again changed their relationship with the Wampanoags. They were no longer a nuisance, but began kidnapping their children, burning down their villages, and forcing the Wampanoag deep into the woods and killing them. Quant again stepped in, but Mashop, being very lazy, sent his five sons to fix the problem instead. The Pukwudgies lured them into deep grass and shot them dead with their magic arrows. Enraged, Quant and Mashop attack as many as they can find, and they crush them. But many escape and scatter throughout all of New England again. The Pukwudgies regroup and trick Mashop into the water and shoot him with their arrows. Some legends say that they killed him, while others claim he became discouraged and depressed about the death of his sons. But Mashop disappears from the Wampanoag's mythology altogether at this point. The Pukwudgies remained, however, but something odd ends up happening. The timing of the tales of the monster are a map through the history of the Native Americans' relationship with the European settlers. The death of the five sons lines up with the very first settlers, and the flight of Mashop is told alongside the changing of attitudes about the new neighbors. The Pukwudgies, always seen in a negative light, become the foot soldiers of the devil which may explain their modern connection to shadow people. As more Native Americans began to convert to Christianity, their myths evolved until the Pukwudgies were responsible for the evil in the village and the hand of Satan on the tribe. People who spend time in the forests of New England will tell you Pukwudgies are not symbols, but a real horror that still stalks people today. They continue to see them, and as the world develops around them, the monsters remain unchanged and as dark as ever. One story is of a woman named Joan who was walking her dog through the state forest in Freetown, Massachusetts, on a cold Saturday morning in April when she saw this monster. As she and her dog Sid walked down the path, Sid became anxious and strayed a few feet into the woods. Joan followed him in and then stopped. Her dog was lying completely flat in the leaves, and on a rock ten feet away was a Pukwudgie. She described him as looking like what she would describe a troll, two feet high with pale gray skin and hair on his arms and the top of his head. The monster seemed to have no clothes, but it was difficult to tell because his stomach hung way over his waist, almost touching his knees. His eyes were a deep green and he had large lips and a long, almost canine nose. The Pukwudgie just stood, watching her, staring straight at her with no expression, almost like it was stunned to see her. Joan froze and remembers thinking that the air in her lungs had been completely pushed out. Sid, her dog, finally came to and ran back towards the trail, dragging Joan, who was still holding the leash, tightly. Although the whole exchange took less than 30 seconds, it remains with Joan ten years later. She has not gone back to the forest, but also feels that that might not be enough. Three times since the event, she has woken up to find the demon looking in on her. It has never attacked her or spoken to her. She has merely seen it looking through her bedroom window, staying just long enough for her to notice him. All three times, she claims she was fully awake and could move if she had to. Another encounter came from a man in Framingham, Massachusetts, who had an experience that scared him so much that it forced him to remain away from the woods. Tim was in a forest when he saw a bright orb in front of him. Having investigated the paranormal before, he was excited and tried to snap a photo with his digital camera. The ball of light disappeared and reappeared a few feet further into the woods. Tim followed this ball of light losing the spirit several times before he realized he had traveled more than 30 feet off the path into a thickly wooded area. He became scared and slowly made his way back to the path, only to find a two-foot man standing there, walking towards him. He ended up turning and running, and looking back saw the figure move back into the woods. Tim reported that what he saw had walked upright and had used its arms to push something aside when he fled to the forest. He had moved with a slight limp, but also moved like a human. The second time that he saw the Pukwudgies was a few years later in a parking lot near the same forest. 
He was listening to the radio quietly and then ended up checking his rearview mirror to look for a friend that he was waiting for when he saw the same small figure of a man. Every detail was identical, and the Pukwudgie just stood there, watching him. The car turned on by itself, and his radio began to get louder and louder. He pulled out of the parking lot and took the long way home to try and stop his hands from shaking. Although the monster seemed content to only frighten Joan and Tim, there are still physical attacks happening. Several people have been assaulted, and one person came down with a mysterious illness after seeing them in a cemetery in New Hampshire. Another woman suffered scratches on her arm after following an orb in a forest in Taunton, Massachusetts. The most disturbing, reoccurring attack might be taking place at the Pukwudgie's favorite hunting ground. In the Freetown State Forest, there is a hundred-foot cliff overlooking a quarry known as the Ledge. There have been many hauntings at this site, but the most frequent experience is an overwhelming feeling to jump to the rocks and water below. In the folklore of the Wampanoag, the Pukwudgies were known to lure people to the cliffs and then push them off to their death. There have been several unexplained suicides at the ledge, often by people who had no signs of depression or mental disease before entering the forest. Pukwudgies are usually described as being knee-high or even smaller. Their name literally means person of the wilderness, and they are usually considered to be spirits of the forest. In some traditions, they have a sweet smell and are sometimes associated with flowers. Pukwudgies have magical powers which vary from tribe to tribe, but may include the ability to turn invisible, confuse people, or make them forget things. They have also been known to shapeshift into cougars or other dangerous animals, or bring harm to people by just staring at them. One of the main things that makes them different from other cryptid entities is the sheath of porcupine spines that run from the top of their head all the way down their back. In fact, when you see one from behind, you may actually mistake it for a porcupine until it turns around and gives you the stink eye. And I find it no coincidence that where these creatures lie is in the center of the Bridgewater Triangle. If you happen to encounter one of these creatures, these little puckwudgies, it is said to please leave it be. Puckwudgies are still bitter about past grievances with human beings and can cause a lot of problems if you bother them. Usually they will leave you alone if you leave them alone. At worst, they'll mess with you a little bit, they're tricksters, but if you make them very angry, you could be facing serious injury. Whether Pukwudgie sightings are a sign of supernatural activity or an actual cryptid being sighted, their status as one of the oldest mythical creatures in North America has been uncontested. Alright bestie, so now I just want to leave you with this. If you are anywhere where Pukwudgies are known to be, and you're on a hike or a walk, and you suddenly hear that the surrounding area has gone silent. The birds have stopped chirping. You no longer hear squirrels running about. Please be respectful. Back away slowly and exit before any harm is done. My sources for this episode include Wikipedia, Spooky South Coast, NativeLanguages.org, and the lineup. All right, guys, so thank you so much for hanging out again today. For more details on the podcast or the cases that we covered, then head on over to the website www.darkcrossroadspodcast.com where we have all of the episodes, um, information about the podcast, merch, and also a blog covering every single case and it going into more description including links to all the places that you need to make phone calls to or resources regarding the case. You can also find us on our most social media platforms. Don't forget to like, share, rate, review, subscribe, wherever you're listening to us. You can subscribe to the podcast. There is a link in all episodes in the notes that will send you to our subscription page and with that you will get bonus content, discount on future merch, and a lot of other extra goodies and kind of behind the scenes information. Um, so 
every single donation through the subscription and any other place goes straight to the podcast. It helps fund research and it really helps us out to keep this podcast going. So before I go, I just want to thank all of my listeners for your continued support and for sending in cases that you wanted covered and stories that you wanted read on the podcast. We truly accept all stories, scary, paranormal, um, funny, anything that you want read or you want me to know, send it in. And any cases that you want covered, please send in. You can email those to darkcrossroadspodcast at gmail.com. And with all of this said, please don't forget to be weird, stay different, and don't trust anyone.